1994, three friends and I set out for the unclimbed north face of Trango Tower, which is um, in the north of Pakistan near K2. And it's kind of like if you took Yosemite's El Capitan and you stuck it on top of the Alps. And just getting to the base of that wall was like climbing a mountain in and of itself. And once we got to the wall, we inched up day after day, just getting higher and higher. And we lived suspended on the wall in these little bat tents. And we melted every, all the water we drank, and we sat out these storms in our little tents and went up and down on increasingly frayed ropes, sometimes, sometimes climbing at night. And after 18 days on the wall, we emerged on the top. <clears throat> and then it took us three days going down the same way uh, to get back to base camp. And uh, this is what it looks like when you take two weeks' worth of food on a three-week climb. <laughs> so I love, still love to alpine climb. I love to surf big waves. And uh, over-caffeinated media often refers to these things as extreme sports and the people who do them as adrenaline junkies and whatever. <laughs> the, I don't actually like to be scared. It usually means I'm doing something stupid. And the reason I did these things is better captured by the words of a British climber, Mo Antoine, who called what he did feeding the rat. <laughs> What he meant was he had an intense craving for deep experiences with an uncertain outcome. And he called that craving the rat. And when he went off to climb in the Himalaya, he called it feeding the rat. That's what I was doing. I was feeding the rat. Now, this talk was supposed to be about the intersection of the personal and the uh, professional. And I'm sure it's obvious to you, by this time, it's a talk on philanthropy, right? Um, anyway, it was about the same time my own life took a turn. I was a newly minted physician. And working in the mountains of Bolivia with a beloved mentor, Reiner Arnhold, we walked through these, <clears throat> these mountain trails, walking together one day when suddenly Reiner fell dead of a major, an enormous stroke. And in the aftermath of that, I got to know his family. And they'd been in banking literally for 300 years. They were very good at it, and they wanted to set up a foundation to carry on his work in some way, and they asked me to help. And so I set out to some of the places that Reiner loved, trying to figure out well, what works, what can we do to carry on Reiner's legacy. Um, he worked in many humanitarian settings, trying to figure out, ultimately, how to make the world a better place for its children. But he loved places like Tibet. He loved places like Afghanistan. And so I traveled in those places trying to figure out what worked. And <clears throat> I saw some, I met some remarkable people. I saw some compelling projects. I learned about some really great ideas. But nobody seemed to be really figuring out what worked. And it felt somehow incomplete, unfulfilling, because I wasn't really figuring out what worked. And I, got, I felt a little lost, like I was actually supposed to be doing something else. And then I met this brilliant guy named Martin Fisher. And Martin was making these manual irrigation pumps that allowed smallholder farmers to go from one crappy, rain-fed crop a year to more high-value crops a couple of times a year using these irrigation pumps. And what's more, he had really good data. He had data showing that the people who bought and used these pumps were increasing their income by a factor of 10. And I was mind blown. I'd never really seen anything like this, and it really resonated with me. And shortly after, in talking with the bankers who were on my board, I realized that we could start thinking about impact as the analog of profit. And we could be thinking about the cost of impact as the analog of return on investment. And that started to change everything. And I realized <clears throat> I had a way to feed the rat. And that way was to make myself accountable for impact to myself, to the world, to my board, 
to try to squeeze the most impact in the world out of the philanthropic money I'd been entrusted with. And then being accountable for impact actually turned a big job that can just be sifting through endless piles of proposals to a real treasure hunt, really. And <clears throat> what, what do we mean by impact, anyway? So what, what we, the way that we do it is we start with something we call the 12, the eight-word mission statement. What we want to know first to try to understand an organization's impact is to think about how would you describe what you do in eight words or less that includes a verb, a target population, and an outcome that implies something to measure? Then the second question is, if you could only measure one thing to know if you were pulling off that mission, what would it be? So let me go through a few to show how you get to your eight-word mission statement and your just one thing. So One Acre Fund bundles together what farmers need to make a decent living off a one-acre plot of land. Their mission, get African farmers out of extreme poverty. Their one thing to measure, income from crops. Living Goods, Avon Ladylike network of women selling health products door to door and doing health education at the same time. They're out there to save African kids' lives. Their just one thing is child mortality. That's, what the, we're, that's what's gonna make us know if they're good at what they do. Off-Grid Electric, and these are all from the Malago portfolio, by the way. Off-Grid Electric in, in Tanzania takes a better solar energy system than you could ever afford and puts it on your roof and then charges you for the power for a good lighting system and um, mobile charger, etc. And they sell you the power for less than you were spending on kerosene previously. Their mission high quality light, very poor people. We like the specificity of that. And what they measure really is the houses that go from essentially darkness to being well lit. Now when you get serious about impact, there's this thing that looms over you. You've got your eight word mission statement dialed and you know what to measure. You actually measure and get some good numbers that show a change over time. You still gotta deal with this thing. The counterfactual is a textual, technical term for what would have happened without you. Because your impact is the difference between what happened with you minus what would have happened without you anyway. And it's kind of scary to confront. So here's what happens when you don't look at it. So Millennium Villages worked in this town in Kenya for five years. At the end of that time, as a way of showing, <clears throat> demonstrating their success, they said mobile phone ownership went from 10 to 40 percent, a 400 percent increase. Wow. Here's the counterfactual. That's what it did throughout rural Kenya. It went from 20 to 50 percent. This didn't have anything to do with their work. This was happening anyway. It takes guts to examine that green line. Another thing, if you get serious about impact, is scale. So as in college, I read E.F. Schumacher's Small is Beautiful. I really dug it. it. It meant a lot to me. And when I first started this work, what I thought was really great was little jewel boxes of projects that were finished and polished. And as you get hungry for impact, your whole aesthetic changes. And you start feeling more like this that scale is beautiful. And just like a physicist who sees Einstein's equation for general relativity, they understand it in a way that it makes it beautiful to them. It's a beautiful equation. Here's my beautiful equation. <laughs> so a scalable solution, meaning lasting impact, meaning it costs it's inexpensive enough that it could actually be done at scale. It's replicable, meaning that it's simple, systematic, broadly adaptable enough that it could be done at scale. And it knows where it's going. It knows it's designed to either scale out via the government, via the market, or via other organizations. 
and an organization that deliver, a kick-ass organization that has leaders who know how to pivot, has the right people in the right positions with the right talent, has the right systems, knows how to raise money. That equals big impact. Is that sexy or what? <laughs> <coughs> and so you end up with this, which means you've got to deal with some of this. We talk about risk and philanthropy, but it's not really serious. Like, most of us are spending somebody else's money, number one. <laughs> and having been in this game for a while, I can tell you nobody ever gets fired for lack of impact. But when you make yourself truly accountable for impact, there is risk. Because if you're trying to squeeze the maximum impact you can out of the money that's been entrusted to you, you need to take some risks. You need to go for where the impact jackpot might be and figure out if you can go there without being foolish and be willing to risk your money on something that might fail. You don't want to be stupid, but you want to be brave. A great example is our friend Alex Petrov. He's a, he's a crazy, and I mean that in the most complimentary, best sense, guy from um, Maine. He's a relentless autodidact, and he had this idea that one-acre farms are never going to get anybody out of poverty in Africa. And what we need is a new model for a family farm that is 10 acres, has oxen, and can use sophisticated agricultural techniques to squeeze some serious money out of the land. Now, this is a super important idea because most of Africa's poor are rural farmers by default. And Africa's never going to emerge into prosperity until we figure out how to have prosperous rural economies. This could be the impact jackpot. Alex went to Uganda to do it, but it was kind of boring. It was a little too stable for him, so he went down to South Kivu in the, in the uh, Democratic Republic of the Congo, which if any of you have been listening to the news, Kivu is always, always, always in trouble. And in the middle of a war, he started a teaching farm to teach people the kind of methods that would allow them to do this kind of farming. And he took on a partner... Fiston Malaga, and Fiston was a member of the aristocracy, really, but he had a real burden to smell, help smallholder farmers, and the two of them made an incredible team, an inspiring team. And it was, they took some serious risks. A number of times, Fiston had to actually hide from assassination squads because he backed the wrong political horse. Now, <clears throat> the cool thing about this is Alex and Fistone are partners. Fistone and me are partners. Now, we talk about partners a lot in philanthropy, too. It's another, another thing we do that's kind of nonsense because, really, it's rarely a partner relationship. It's they need the money, we got the money. It's an asymmetric power relationship. When you're seriously accountable for impact, though, I need Fistone more than Fistone needs me because impact is harder to find than money. That's the truth you find when you're really out there hunting impact. It's harder to find than money. We are real partners. We sink or swim together. So to finish up, I'll tell you, feed the rat. Whether you're a doer, a donor, a cheerleader in the whole social sector, Feed the rat. Be accountable for impact. If we really do that, we might end up with a social sector that functions like a real market for impact, that can get resources efficiently to those that are best at creating change. And if we can do that, we're going to make a big dent in the world's problems. And I promise you, if we do it that way, we're going to have more fun doing it. Thank you. Thank you.